Coming up on Mayo Clinic Q&A. Earlier on, we didn't realize that brain fog was going to be such a big issue with the lingering effects of COVID-19. Fatigue and brain fog are common symptoms for COVID long haulers, those people impacted by long-lasting effects of the virus. We're really hopeful with time, with improvement in the chemistry, with a rehabilitation program, you're going to get better. Welcome everyone to Mayo Clinic q and I'm Dr. Helena Gazelka. As we've learned from a year of dealing with COVID-19, the signs and symptoms of, viral in, of the viral infection can vary widely from individual to individual. And that's true of the long-term effects as well. Some people recover very quickly while others seem to suffer for effects for quite a long period of time. One of the long-term effects seen in patients who've had COVID-19 is described as brain fog. This can include short-term memory loss, confusion, difficulty concentrating, or just feeling different than they did before they had the infection. With us to discuss this today is Dr. Billy Schultz. She's a physical medicine and rehabilitation expert at the Mayo Clinic in Rochester, Minnesota. Thanks for being here with us today, Dr. Schultz. Thank you very much for inviting me. Well, I'm kind of fascinated by this topic because brain fog doesn't sound like a, a term that we would use in medicine very much, but it's great for our listeners because it sort of makes sense to us. Mm -hmm. Who's most likely to develop this after they have a COVID-19 infection? You know, I wish I had a good answer for that, but quite honestly, anybody can develop it. So they've looked at who is more likely to have these symptoms that linger. And maybe there's a trend toward if you're older or have other medical conditions going on. But honestly, anybody can. It doesn't depend, doesn't necessarily depend on the severity of the COVID infection. It doesn't necessarily depend on the patient's age. It doesn't necessarily depend on their educational level. It can really be anybody that we see. I think that's one of the fascinating things about this uh, virus, Billy, is that it seems like we say that about most of the um, difficulties or complications from the virus, that there are some individuals that we can identify maybe more at risk, but sometimes it just surprises us who has issues. Absolutely. And this is one of those things. In fact, earlier on, we didn't realize that brain fog was going to be such a big issue with the lingering effects of COVID-19. And as we learn more and more about this, we're realizing really how the brain is affected. And you probably know it because you're looking for it. How common is this in patients? You know, we don't necessarily know how common, but we do know just estimates about 10% of patients who have been infected with COVID-19 actually fall into this long hauler group or this group that have these lingering symptoms that can actually last for months. Um, and so the the Fatigue is probably the most common um, symptom in this long hauler group, but brain fog is right up there with these patients. So probably about 10%, maybe a little more, maybe a little less. You know, I was complimenting you on your artwork behind you uh, before we started uh, recording this today. So I know that I'm asking the right questions to the right person. I'm wondering about neurologic um, signs and symptoms. Why does COVID cause uh, neurologic issues and is it doing something to alter the brain or the chemistry in some way? So it seems to be more of an inflammatory process. So actually there have been papers published relatively recently looking at um, what really causes this. And there are instances where there is infection causing this, but for the most part, it's an inflammatory process within the brain. So if I MRI somebody's brain, it's going to look the exact same because it's more at this microscopic level. And also, we don't necessarily know how long the inflammation lasts, but it does change the chemistry and changes how the brain processes things. So the diagnosis then is would be what we would say in medicine is clinical. In other words, there's not a lab test that we can get that will tell us someone's going to have brain fog and there's not an imaging study that we can do. That's absolutely right. We do have some of more objective testing. Sometimes we'll do neuropsychometric testing, which is basically a really extensive test looking at different areas of thinking, looking at memory, looking at attention, looking at focus, looking at mental flexibility or that ability to you know, change your mind or do something different and not get stuck on one solution to a problem. And those are more objective and they're kind of these things that are out there, but not everybody needs those type of testing, that type of testing to be done in order to diagnose somebody with brain fog. 
And I imagine it would be a specialist who does that type of testing. Is that something that a primary care uh, physician would typically do or no? No, this is something that we actually, there are very special neuropsychologists, which are doctorate level or PhD level psychologists that administer and interpret these tests. You know, we've talked in the past on the program about long haulers disease. Is this um, brain fog a form of long haulers disease? Yes. It is. It absolutely is. And this is probably one of the forms of long haulers disease that really affects the person's ability to get back into their life, kind of those community reentry things. Being a mother, being a father, being a student, being an employee, being a grandmother, being a member of a quilting group, or going to McDonald's with your friends to get your coffee. All of those things are affected by brain fog. It is amazing what we have learned about COVID-19 in just one short year. And I might be asking you a question that there is not yet an answer for, but is this a, a permanent state or if not, how long does it last? You're absolutely right. We don't have an answer for that. Um, we have seen people recover for, from it. And what we're telling patients when we're seeing them is exactly what I said. We don't know, but we are using information from other conditions that affect the brain and cause cognition or brain fog type symptoms um, as kind of our surrogate for how we manage and how we anticipate improvement. And so as an example, using a patient who'd had a concussion as an example, we do expect improvement in those patients. And so we're saying, and that's a change in brain chemistry with a concussion. And so we're hopeful that we'll continue to see improvement in these patients. So interesting, because you said that this is an inflammatory uh, mm -hmm. disorder of sorts and comparing it, it might be a little bit like comparing apples to oranges a little bit to other uh, types of neurologic disorders. It absolutely is, but it's the best we can do, quite honestly. We're still learning so much about this that we're just trying to extrapolate from something um, to really get an idea of how should we treat these patients, what should we do, and how should we advise them you know, as far as that recovery. So what we're telling patients is, you know, we're really hopeful with time, with improvement in the chemistry, with a rehabilitation program, you're going to get better. Well, that's good news. You answered this a little bit um, earlier, Billy, but I just wanted to go back to whether the severity of the COVID-19 infection correlates with the severity of the brain fog or long haulers type of symptoms. Now, can someone just have very mild disease where they stay at home and quarantined for the illness and then develop this, or is it always people who've been hospitalized? Absolutely, patients that have been home with a very mild form of the disease do develop this. They're really, it's it does not mean you need to be hospitalized. You didn't need to have the tube to help you breathe and be intubated. None of that. We have multiple patients that are coming through that honestly had symptoms, stayed at home, actually did quite well, and then tried to go back to work or tried to get back into their life and realize something's different. So if we have listeners who are concerned that they might be suffering from brain fog or that someone they know or love might be, what would be the advice on what kind of help to seek? I think probably the first thing and the most important thing is to make sure you seek help with medical providers. And given that COVID-19 and especially long hauler syndrome or these syndromes can affect multiple organ systems, people can have fatigue, people can have breathing problems, as well as brain problems, it's important to seek care at a multidisciplinary medical center where you can see specialties in all this areas. So, Billy, you talked a little bit earlier about some of the tests that you might use to help identify individuals who might have this issue with brain fog, but then once you've identified them, what is it that, that you do specifically to help them to recover? So, unfortunately, there's not a pill or anything like that that we can give a patient and they're just going to recover from this. So, it really is dependent on a rehabilitation approach. So, with cogn cognitive rehabilitation or rehabilitation, looking at brain function and thinking and attention and focus, um, we actually have both speech pathologists and occupational therapists that help provide this therapy. And this therapy has two specific parts to it. So, there is compensation as well as restoration. Compensation being we're having these problems, we're seeing these problems, how can we change the environment around us to make us more successful? So if somebody's having problems with memory, they might write 
use more notes or use alarms to remind them to do something. Start using different mnemonics or other things to remember. Have a family member who reminds them of certain things. As opposed to the restoration therapy, which is more, let's make this better. Let's actually work on improvement. And that is very focused on not just, you know, being on your computer, doing brain game type things, but finding ways to work that improvement into day-to-day -day life. And there's a lot of evidence and actually manuals and textbooks and how to provide um, restor restorative cognitive rehabilitation. Uh, I remember a number of months ago discussing with one of your colleagues that Mayo Clinic has a program, I believe, that we've set up specifically for individuals with long haulers um, and that it is a multidisciplinary um, uh, clinic. Could you tell us a little bit about that and how your work fits in? Absolutely. So a lot of our patients start in this program that Dr. Van had described, um, which is uh, basically a comprehensive rehabilitation program. So they're working with multiple providers. A lot of the therapy is focused on the fatigue and some of those physical symptoms people are experiencing. So they work with our um, therapist in both physical and occupational therapy on those pieces. Then when they're going through that initial evaluation, if they have any complaints of brain fog, they come our way for that cognitive piece. And so they're evaluated by one of our medical team um, to really determine, okay, what are those challenges they're having? Is it more attention? Is it more multi multitasking? Is it more that memory piece so that we can craft this rehabilitation program for them and be able to connect them with the right therapist to provide that cognitive rehabilitation? That's wonderful. Billy, you and I uh, were, had the joy of being residents together a number of years ago now, and I learned quite a bit from you then. And uh, you subsequently went into physical medicine and rehabilitation with a, a specialty in brain rehabilitation, correct? Correct. Yep. Tell me what that means. So... Um... First, physical medicine and rehabilitation is really focused on functioning. So a lot of amazing physicians are out there who are great at diagnosing something and coming up with that medical plan to treat something or prevent it from happening again. And then we come into the situation and we're like, wonderful, you have that diagnosis, um, but how is this affecting your life? How is this affecting your function? How is this affecting your ability to do the things that you need and want to do? And so we work with um, both medications, with injections, with um, therapists, with an entire multidisciplinary team to help provide the patient rehabilitation and or other interventions to help improve their, improve their life or their function. Um, when, I, when I decided to go into brain injury rehabilitation, really what that meant is I got to go and do more training because isn't that what we all wanna do in medicine? So I had the opportunity to um, train specifically in brain injury medicine, medicine and brain injury being any kind of brain injury. So not just traumatic brain injury, but strokes and tumors and infections and um, COVID-19. I mean, things that are novel that we haven't heard of before um, and really focused on what we can do from an intervention standpoint for that. And one of the unique things with brain injury medicine is really that cognitive or brain piece to it that's different than my colleagues who work in the spinal cord medicine field or in the musculoskeletal rehabilitation field. Brain is really special in that it encompasses, you know, your thinking, your mood, your vision, your um, body function, just everything falls into brain injury medicine. So it's a really holistic, fun field to work in. <laughs> that's really interesting. And that's one of another of the things that I have found so fascinating about COVID-19. I think in the beginning, many of us thought, well, this will be the purview of primary care providers and of uh, maybe physicians who specialize in infectious disease. But now we have every discipline of medicine involved, cardiologists and PM&R physicians and pain physicians, uh, many, many specialists, vascular doctors. And uh, so it's been really interesting to see how just in a year uh, we have come together and learned so much uh, together about this disease. Yeah, it's been it's been a learning experience for all of us, obviously. I think from the rehabilitation realm or the PM&R realm, initially we were like, oh, this isn't going to affect us that much. How can we help in other areas? Um, but turns out we're, you know, 
for those patients that are severely affected who may have problems with their with their lungs or other things, some of them are coming to the rehabilitation unit afterward to work on things to get them home safely. And then we have those patients that we're seeing more long-term for things like brain fog or fatigue or pain or other things. Okay. Again, oh, sorry, again, oh, focus ahead, on getting you back to life. That's what we want to do. Well, that's right. Like so many other things where mm -hmm. the, you described earlier that the, the individual has recovered from the illness, but now has to deal with the after effects. So thanks so much for sharing with us today. No problem. I'm very happy to share. <laughs> Our thanks to Dr. Billy Schultz, physical medicine and rehabilitation a specialist, as well as a brain injury rehab specialist at the Mayo Clinic. I hope that you learned something today because I know that I did. We wish you a wonderful day. Mayo Clinic Q&A is a production of the Mayo Clinic News Network and is available wherever you get and subscribe to your favorite podcasts. To see a list of all Mayo Clinic podcasts, visit newsnetwork.mayoclinic.org. Then click on podcasts. Thanks for listening and be well. We hope you'll offer a review of this and other episodes when the option is available. Comments and questions can also be sent to Mayo Clinic News Network at mayo.edu.